Mike Lombardo. Hello. 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 Hey. Um. So I am so sorry, guys. My roommate just fell down the stairs, so oh we have to God. take her to urgent care to get stitches. Um. If that's you, I don't know how long that's gonna take. I don't know if you guys can hold off for like an hour or. That's that's a question for you, my friend. We can we can coast. We'll chill. All right, yeah. No we're... pressure. Okay, I no, will keep no you pressure. in touch. Um, hopefully this won't take long, but I will be right back. No, um, yeah, no problem. God, absolutely. Yeah, Unfortunately, no. um, this is probably maybe worse than watching Nightmare on Elm Street 2010. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, um, but I will be I will be back in a little God. bit. I'll be All back right, yeah, yes. take your right, time. I'll just, just I'll Twitter message you and keep you posted. Okay, yeah. sounds good. Right, cool, man. Thank you. <laughs> absolutely. No yeah, but best luck. Hi everybody, this is Nate while editing this episode. I just wanted to say thank you for listening to uh, the final episode of our Halloween season for 2022, and a huge thank you to Mike Lombardo for coming on and talking to us. Um, I just wanted to say that first and foremost, there are some heavy topics in this movie that might not be suitable for all. So if, uh, if you do not want to hear that, you might want to skip this episode. However, if uh, you're feeling up to it, please listen on. And also, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mike, my co-host, uh, his mic cut out a few times. Um, but I'm going to do some editing magic and hope that it is still listenable for you. So again, thank you very much and enjoy the episode. Happy Halloween. What's up? So my new roommate, uh, she tripped going down the stairs apparently, and hit the uh, the railing and at like, it's like an inch and a half long gash that's like a half inch wide, like down to like the meat. Ooh. And she's like, "Do I need to go to the doctor?" I was like, "Um, yes, yes, you do. <laughs> I think you're gonna need some stitches." My name is Nate. My name is Mike. My name is also Mike. And what the hell was that? <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> what the hell was that? This this was was a, a pretty horrendous watch, I have to say, and not in the way that you would hope horror movies would be horrendous. I uh, I haven't seen this movie since opening night, um, back in 2010 in the theater, and uh, I had much like the main character had repressed the memory, of, uh, <laughs> Mr. Fred Krueger. You see, I recently watched the original Nightmare on Elm Street for the first time. You know, honestly, I, I this might be kind of controversial, but I was not super impressed by it. Although the more that I've watched it, it's definitely like grown on me. This is just like god awful though. Like there's no redeeming qualities at all. Um, I don't know if there's no redeeming qualities, but it definitely <laughs> is not a great movie. The original is a classic. Um, I'm not a huge slasher fan, but I do like, um, I, well, I, rather, I love Nightmare on Elm Street because of the special effects. That's the saving grace of Nightmare on Elm Street, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, Robert England is great. The performances are great. We got baby Johnny Depp in his crop top. Um, you know, there's a lot of funny 80s stuff. But, like, the original is a classic movie. But what killed me about the remake is that, I mean, I, I can't remember the exact runtime on the original. But in that mm -hmm. time, we were introduced to a cast of characters. We got to know them a little bit. We saw that they have, in fact, do have interactions with each other unrelated to being killed. And, yeah. um... There was a plot established, conflict, resolution, like stuff happened in the exact same amount of time in the remake. We're introduced to like WB uh, clone that uh, people that they're literally introduced three minutes before they're killed. So I have no fucking clue who any of these people are or the <laughs> fact that they even know each other outside of like some random expositionary dialogue. Exactly. Yeah. Th there's so much of just like, we know each other. Right? It's like, oh, yeah, I guess they know each yeah, other. They kept saying, we've only known each other since high school. It's like, that's great, but I literally am seeing you right before you die. Like, there is no actual interaction between any of these characters. And it's like, I love the opening scene because they're at the, the funeral of, I guess, their friend? Yeah, right. Like, oh, no, <laughs> not old John, our best <laughs> friend, that we're like, okay, I guess they were friends. I don't know. Nobody particularly concerned or upset that their friends are dead so i don't know yeah it's it's really weird and like all the acting of mike said when we were watching it's like this must have been before like the cw took off because it's got like 
all of that energy and they just needed to funnel it somewhere. So I guess they put it in this yeah, movie. So, so that's why I said when I said like the WB cloning vats, because when I was yeah. young and that's what it was before it was a CW, but that's what it felt like. It was just a very like weirdly pretty cast of people. Um, <laughs> they didn't feel real. Also, I thought it was really weird that like Nancy and I don't know who the other girl's name was. I can't remember. Their mother was like three years older than them. Apparently. Yeah, <laughs> like they- that was that was actually that was something specifically that I was thinking about through most of the movie was that like uh, the the cast of characters like the age range like seemed like all over the place. Yeah. Like there were a few people who were like like Nancy for example. It's like I with a little bit of uh, imagination I can imagine that you're a high schooler. But like her friend who is like the the other girl who dies. It was like. I, I cannot believe that you guys are at all in the same age range. Right. No, not not at all. Um, and then the uh, the main character, the kid, uh, the guy, his dad's Clancy Brown, who's clearly <laughs> in his like sixties. And Clancy Brown's a wonderful actor. He was one of the. Oh yeah, he's great. Right. right. And actually, it kills me because Jack Earl Haley is actually a really great actor. He's mm-hmm. just not a great Freddy. Yeah, I, I can see that. Mm-hmm. And I think the biggest problem with him is like he's he's trying really hard. Mm-hmm. He is like I gotta give it to very him. hard, but his makeup, he looks like a newt. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. he looks like a like an like an awkward alien. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, or like an alien. Yeah, he looks. And so what kills me is accurate burn makeup. Like as a special right. effects artist, I I I see the stuff and I'm like, okay, I get why you did this. Right. But the number one lesson that I've learned doing special effects is that in order to make something look real, you need to make it look fake. Because yeah. real life wounds and trauma, like as I just discovered with my roommate who fell on the stairs <laughs> and ripped her arm open, it doesn't look very interesting. It's just like kind of a red smear with some like wiggly bits. Yeah. It look right. like anything. <laughs> Burned flesh literally looks fake. It looks like silicone or gelatin because it's just right, right. super smooth. Mm-hmm. So he doesn't look good. He looks realistic. Well, kind of. <laughs> right. It's not interesting looking. Freddy Krueger from the original movies was a very stylized. That made him look very cool and unique. Right. It does not look cool and unique. And he, they also CG like chunks of his face out. So he, yeah, also tracking on him is obviously from 2010. So oh, yeah. it's a little juddery. So it definitely like you get like a really really funky like uncanny valley. Like I honestly think he looks his makeup looks better in the Mortal Kombat DLC. <laughs> 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 yeah, I'd say you're probably right, which actually, you know, this this I think um, works as a pretty good segue. So Mike knows what he's talking about, and Mike knows what he's talking about because Mike is a director, writer, special effect artist, and probably a lot of other things that I Man can't about remember town, off the top of my head. As they say. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> yeah, actually, uh, I guess before we get too far into the whole uh, Nightmare on Elm Street thing any further than we already have, would you like to give uh, like an introduction of yourself uh, and maybe sure. uh, plug anything you want to plug? My name is Mike Lombardo. I am uh, an independent filmmaker. I am the writer slash director of I'm Dreaming of a White Doomsday, which was featured in a previous episode of this lovely show. I just released my first book, Please Don't Tap on the Glass and Other Tales of the Melancholy and Grotesque, which is available on Amazon right now. And I am the star of the upcoming documentary about independent horror filmmaking, The Brilliant Terror, which is on the film festival circuit right now. I actually just got back from Milan, Italy, um, for Cine Underground, where we did our Italian premiere in one best feature, which was very cool. So if you're not tired of listening to this, then check that out. Things went pretty well in Italy, huh? Uh, They they went fantastic. Uh, (laughs) I made the Italians cry. They made me cry. Lots of crying. And that's the... The benchmark of any successful festival experience is if I cry, it's probably a good time. Right. Hell yeah. I've been meaning to ask, um, is is there any way to, to watch the documentary yet? Or is it like... Um, outside of film festivals, no. So we did a world premiere at um, Arrow Videos Fright Fest in London, which I, I missed because uh, my passport came two days late, which kills me. To uh, uh, then we played in Montreal. We played in San Francisco, New York, Milan, and I don't know if I said Montreal. Um, I don't know where it's playing next. Oh, uh, Virginia Genre Blast. Hopefully, it will be doing a local premiere here in Pennsylvania soon. And then uh, I know there's a lot of a couple distributors that they are talking to right now. Hell yeah! So hopefully, it'll be available sometime next year um, to stream or DVD, Blu-ray, or whatever it's going to be. But um, it's doing great. I think we won four or five awards so far, which is pretty cool. So that's so yeah, awesome. absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Let us know when it is um, going to be locally, because we will definitely make sure that we get there, and uh, we'll okay. try to 
drag some of our friends along too. Excellent. Absolutely. Look forward to it. But let's get into this terrible movie. Do you sure. remember? Oh, you know, actually, I remember exactly where this movie uh, starts because it is a terrible dream sequence in the diner, right? Oh, right. God, right. Yeah, I had already forgotten. What yeah. do you know? Yeah. <laughs> we got a, um invitation part two here as far as the... Ah, yes. Movie. Yes. So, yeah, so this movie starts with... Um, Dean, Dean, yes. Yes, they, Dean. They screamed it like 19 times in the first... Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> yeah, so Dean is uh, is hanging out at this diner, and he clearly is, like, uh, not having a good time. He looks, uh, dare I even say, sleep-deprived. Ah. Uh, and... He's trying to get a pot of coffee, but this uh, waitress just doesn't seem to give a flying fuck about him. And so she walks right on past him, and uh, after saying some expletives, he follows her into the kitchen, where at no point he uh, senses anything is off. And after seeing severed pig heads and other uh, delicious treats, he is confronted by Freddy Krueger himself, uh, who gives him a nice slash on the hand before he wakes up. Or at least, like, he wakes up to the waitress, like, t- attempting to wake him up. And she's kind of like, hey, hey, I told you if you fall asleep again, we have to kick you out. That's right. And so then he's like, oh, I'm sorry. I won't fall asleep again. And his uh, his steak is a bit rare on his plate. Yeah, 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 because some of his own blood has gotten onto the plate there from the Freddy Slash. Some girl named Chris comes by, right? And she's just like, hey, Dean, what's up? We, we're friends, I guess. <laughs> were they dating? I don't remember. Yeah, it's, it seemed like it, you yeah. know. No, no, his uh, because the other guy was jealous at the other table. That was the only right. indication yeah, yeah. that they knew each other. She's like, oh, they dated once, and then it's never discussed again. Yes, exactly. She's like, oh, hey, Dean, you look like you haven't slept in forever. <laughs> and he uh, more or less is like, you're right, I haven't. Um, I'm having terrible nightmares, <laughs> and I'm going to die. She's like, yeah, right. That's not real. We see at the table over, we have good old uh, Quentin and uh, his cast of uh, friends who are totally relevant throughout the rest of the film. 100%. And uh, they are like, hey, look, there's Chris and Dean talking. And much like Mike said, they're like, ooh, there's Chris and Dean talking. <laughs> um, and so then uh, Chris decides to get up for some reason. And then Dean falls back asleep. Right. Where he comes face to face once again with uh, the deformed alien known as Freddy Krueger. Right. And he slits his own throat. Well, actually, no, he doesn't slit his own throat. He holds the knife, uh, preparing to slit his own throat. And Chris is like, hey, stop that. (laughs) And then he slits his own throat. So, what really confused me about that scene was all the other moments of violence in the movie, like Freddy, you know, he slashes you. If you get hurt in your dream, you die in the dream, you die in real life. Mm hmm. At no point does Dean have a knife in the dream, so why yeah. is he holding the knife to his own throat? It doesn't make any fucking sense. Like, Freddy, right. presumably Freddy slit his throat with his finger gloves mm-hmm. or finger knives, but I don't know why Dean would hold a knife to his own throat. That doesn't actually make any <laughs> sense. Yeah. yeah, see, this is what I what I what what really annoys me about this movie and, like, other hor- movies within the horror genre is that I can get with, like, wacky, zany stuff, but there has to be some consistency like that. Like there's just like glaring inconsistencies there. And another thing specifically about Nightmare on Elm Street that Mike and I were talking about is that I think there's a problem that you run into. And I think this is a problem with the original as well, uh, where this is, again, really similar to a movie we just watched recently, The Invitation, where there's a scene where in The Invitation, there's a scene where the main character goes out for a jog and then she has a scare and then she like wakes up in her bed. But then there are other things that happen that imply that she actually did go for a jog, but it's not cl- it's not made clear like what was actually real and what was a dream. And I feel like there's a lot of moments like that uh, in this movie as well as the original, where you're like, wait, so so can we just be on the same page as to like what is actually happening in the real world and what is not? Yeah, this is something we're going to encounter later in the film. But there seems to be a problem when you have a surprise dream sequence where. It has not – what it does is it interrupts what beforehand seems like just a consistent, uh, you know, narrative continuity moment. Or what exactly was the dream and what was not the dream? Like what parts did they actually do when they were awake and which parts are only the dream parts? And and we'll we'll encounter a scene that we have to ask this question for a little bit later in the film with Chris. But it's one of these problems with like surprise dream sequences when you have these moments. 
So yeah. that that type of narrative device, I actually really like when they when they morph reality into a dream sequence. Mm -hmm. um, when they have those clues that like they might have actually gone for a jog, those types of weird little moments, I love that. That's a staple of '80s horror. Um, uh -huh. A really effective one is Pet Cemetery, when the uh, character of Lewis goes mm -hmm. out. He dreams that he's going out into the the woods, and he goes to the the Micmac burial ground with the um, the ghost of uh, the student who had his head caved in by the car accident. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then he wakes up, and there's there's dirt in his bed, like he actually did walk out there. So those moments, it's just it's an eerie thing when it's done properly. Right. This movie yeah. didn't really do it well, but I do love that narrative device. And that's one thing that I thought would be really interesting for a modern day Nightmare on Elm Street is that they could, special effects technology now, seamlessly morph the dream world and the real world. And I think that they right. kind of did it successfully a few times where the lighting just starts to mm -hmm. subtly shift. When they don't go, like, full-blown CGI, like, backdrops, yeah. moving, which they do do as well, and I'm not a fan of that. But I do think that they did some interesting transitions that were cool. They did a really cool flashback later in the film where they see a Polaroid or a photo of, like, a class photo, and the yeah. camera actually goes into it, and it's reality. I love that. Yeah. So there's some cool stuff, but it's done very sloppily, and there's so little actual narrative going on anyway <laughs> that it, it's it's... More jarring than I think it would have been if it was done properly. Yeah, I think I think you definitely have a point that, given the right scenarios, it definitely does serve a really good purpose in in a film. But I I think a lot of times, and uh, especially with the movies that Mike and I tend to watch, we unfortunately get to see the uh, the 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 shit end of that deal yeah. most of the time. So my favorite usage of that device is they used to do it a lot in '80s TV shows. Are you guys familiar with MacGyver? I, vaguely. Like, yeah, vaguely. Dean Anderson. So there is an episode of MacGyver that he, um, it's a whole episode that's taking place in the old, like the Wild West. Mm -hmm. And he meets like his grandfather or something, and he's got his trademark Swiss Army knife in the show that he always has. So back in Old West times, he finds a Swiss Army knife. He's given one that's like hand carved or something. Mm -hmm. So he goes through this whole like Western adventure. And then he wakes up, and it was all a dream, of course, because it's just an excuse to have a period piece for a MacGyver episode. <laughs> yeah. He wakes up, but lo, what's in his hand is an old wooden pocket knife. Right. And if you think about it, it actually doesn't make any fucking sense at all. But right. I love that. Well, I guess, so, he, so here's actually, here's the thing, because I think that stuff is fun. And I'll bring it back again to that movie, the, the Invitation, that we were talking about. Because I'll set the scene a little bit more and, and kind of give you the, the reason why we were like, wait, what, what, what happened here? Because basically the main character is on the phone with her, uh, her friend. And she's like, all right, I'm going to go now. I'm going to go for a jog. And so then we see her go for said jog and then jump scare. And then she wakes up in bed. So the question that we had was, it was like, wait, did she go for a jog? If she did, did she get like, did she pass out and then just like somebody brought her back to bed? Or did she just go to bed and this whole jogging thing, including the phone call where she talks to the friend and says, hey, I'm going for a jog. Is that part of a dream? Like that stuff is like, I, I, I understand the, the, that when it works well, it works well. But like that just, I think, raises much more questions than answers yeah, well, or ambiance for that matter. If it has well, no well, narrative purpose for doing right. it, like, yeah. they, have, like, they, they actually do that a lot in the remake of Nightmare on Elm Street where they have to qualify all of their like gimmicky transitions, especially the micro naps. Yeah. yeah. I remember seeing the theater. I thought that sequence was really cool. This is a part when they're in a convenience store and – yeah, right. Yeah, that was a cool one. Freddy is coming at him in one single shot, and he keeps disappearing and appearing. I thought that was really cool. Mm -hmm. Watching it again, I realized that they explain what a micro nap is about 16 times in the right. 20 minutes leading up to that scene. And that's yeah. like, okay, I get it. I think you're probably going to do something with this micro nap concept. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that is especially confusing because the main character literally injects himself with raw adrenaline. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. Before that scene. <laughs> Yeah, like how does that how does that happen? Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of questionable decisions in this film. What's his name is dead, uh, Dean. Dean's <laughs> dead, and they're they're at the funeral. And uh, again, we have a lot of people who are like, "Oh yeah, I I knew him or didn't know him." Yeah, I think Chris is specifically sitting there, and she like sees a little girl, right. and she starts to get her uh, Freddy Krueger esque 
illusions. There we go. Sure. Yeah, sure. That's a good one. Yeah, is that good? Dream world comes a calling. Exactly. Yeah, so she starts having some moments like that. She's looking at, like, pictures. Uh, you know, a lot of times at funerals, they'll have, like, collages of, like, oh, re- remembering so-and-so. So there's, like, a picture on one of these collage boards that has what seems to be her as a young girl uh, with Dean as a young boy. An ex-boyfriend or whatever who was getting jealous. He comes up, and he's like, oh, I didn't know that you knew Dean for so long. She's like, oh, I didn't. I, I met him in high school. It's like, well, you clearly didn't. But. There's like photographic evidence. Like I, I guess you don't remember it, but no. Like you, I don't know why she's so steadfast and like no, I didn't meet him. It's like uh, you clearly did. There's a right. photo that raises a lot of questions about later when they reveal that they all went to the same preschool. Right. Yeah, that the parents were trying to, um, you know, hide Amazing. the fact of like what happened with Freddie. But it's like, did, did they erase their memories? It's like, oh yeah, all these kids yeah. I played with all the time. Every single yeah. one of right. these kids. Just don't remember speaking to this person, right? Or their friends at all. That cult. It's like how, like there was one oh, kid oh, oh. I understand, but like all of them, they're like what? And and like beyond that, like once they separate them from the preschool due to the traumatic nature of the events they endured, they're like all right, all right, all right. So we'll separate them from first through eighth grade. But once ninth grade hits, we're gonna <laughs> send them all back to the same high school. You know, like, you know, it's like I don't. Which also begs the question, too, if they all went to the same preschool, that would imply that they all lived in the same neighborhood. Right. I was just thinking that when you were saying that, because I was like, why does she have to go so far out of her way to, like, find these? I mean, I guess people move away, but, like, even still, that, like, that is an interesting thing. But, you know, that my understanding is that the titular nightmare happens, in fact, on Elm Street. Uh-huh. Right. Very little takes place at 1428 <laughs> Elm, which is an infamous right. horror house, but, like, mm-hmm. very little actually takes place there at yeah. all so yeah. all of the yep. kids were like elm street kids that was the whole premise of the film and it's like well right. wouldn't they know that they grew up at a house across the street from these people right yes exactly i'm pretty sure that maybe she like is like talking to her mom and most uh, strange interactions between a mother and daughter i've ever seen i was saying to mike this really sounded like um like a video game npc yeah like she might as well have just been uh, like bobbing it's like Oh, the photos are in the garage. You should go check. And then, like, walks into a wall. Yeah. Um, I have yes. to fly away for three days. <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah, not yeah, even yeah. a plot point. <laughs> so it's like, okay, that's great. But then, then she goes, so she goes into the garage, of course, to try to find mm-hmm. photos. Or she's looking at a photo album and sees that where the photos would have been because they are <laughs> sun-bleached outlines as though they right. were hanging on the wall. Right. Like you clear, you clearly have been hiding this for a while. Why would you keep those pages blank <laughs> yeah. as if to imply that there are like years missing? But like, what kills me is it's like the the photos have like out like sun bleached outlines. They absolutely do. Yeah, I get why because that's just a visual cue. So it doesn't. It's not logical. But in movie world, you want to make sure yeah. the audience is aware. But it's like okay, right. so I just. Took those photos out. I didn't destroy those photos. I just took them out of the album and put them up in like. These massive labeled boxes in the attic that have the exact year and like date yeah. and location the photos were taken. Yes. Of the nine things that are in that attic, this is six of them. Yeah. <laughs> right. Then she goes up to the attic to try to, you know, suss out what's going on. And then it's this entire like extended like suspense scene. The horror from Nightmare on Elm Street comes from when the characters are sleeping. When she right. gets up and walks in the fucking attic, what's the difference? I don't care. It's like oh, that's great. I'm gonna go to the, the, the my downstairs bathroom. Da, da, da. Right. <laughs> yes. Like, yeah. Yeah. It, Boy, do I feel wide awake? Right. It's not. It's not like a traditional slasher thing where Freddy's waiting to jump out at her in yeah, the attic. Yeah. Right. The attic poses no actual danger. Her sleeping does. Right. It. I don't know. It's just a lot of really strange choices that they made. I just. Yeah. I get in the impression that they chopped out like half of the script. Like I felt like I was watching half of a movie. Hmm. It really did feel that way. Like this, it's it's so weird that like this movie felt like it dragged on, but there was so like little actually happening. Yeah, exactly. I don't understand what the entirety of the runtime was. Like I said, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, you get to know the characters, and like there's a lot that goes on, and they yeah. build up the scares. This was like a highlight reel of all the famous special effects scenes from the original, just done very poorly in CGI. <laughs> yeah. And then I don't know what the other like hour and eleven minutes was. I really don't. 
Truly. It's because what the fuck happened in this movie, you know? Well, but I think, I think it's one of these things where the movie had to try to split its time between resolving the new narrative that they've imposed on, like, the Freddy Krueger character. Mm -hmm. And so in that way, it became almost a procedural and mm -hmm. half, like, horror film where they're like, oh, we got to search for answers to, like, what could be uh, connecting uh, and making us be haunted. So they had to dedicate a lot of time to trying to, like, do investigatory type stuff. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really good point. You know, and uh, I, I think I think with the attic scene, this is one of those problems where it's like uh, once a genre has been established enough to have tropes and standards of like kind of uh, basic practice, you get people who utilize these types of uh, tension building devices, like you point out, for no real end. They lose sight of why in favor of just doing the recognizable tension building devices. So someone goes into an attic, you have to do a spooky lingering flashlight part where there's there's tense music and a I slow mean, walk. I mean, again, to keep bringing it back to, to the invitation, this is like the same fucking thing that we talked about with that, where like somebody wrote a vampire like romance movie, and right. then the studio was like, uh, we need a horror movie. And then the writer was like, okay, horror movie, horror movie. Creepy room that you don't go into. Right. And like, just shit like that. Well, what kills me about this, them doing such generic stuff in this, is that Nightmare on Elm Street has, is famous for its inventive sequences. Like, you can do, you can literally bend reality any way. That's what I hate right. about the opening of this in the diner. If the dream sequence is like, okay, there's some some janky lighting, which is cool. Like, I love the lighting. Right. But it doesn't look that far off from, like, a shitty diner I've eaten at. Then he goes <laughs> yeah, that was, and, that's and, a big point. Like it, I feel like when when the real world was like shown, the lighting was really similar to the dream world. Like it wasn't really like uh, identifiable. Yeah, there's not there's not a lot going on, and like the stuff that you need to really amplify the surreal to make it interesting. Like there's a movie called Alone in the Dark, not the uh, Uwe Boll movie. It was an '80s movie with Jack Palance, but there's a really great opening sequence where there's a guy is sitting in a diner and. He goes uh, to order, like, some food, and the waitress is suddenly holding this giant fucking meat cleaver and is, like, splitting, like, a cow in half or a right. pig. And then it starts fucking, like, his coffee is, like, turns to blood, and then it starts right. raining fish. Like, it's really fucking weird. Mm -hmm. And right. then he wakes up. And, like, that's really cool because that's, like, surreal. This, he just walks into yeah. the kitchen, and there's just, like, flaming pig parts. Right. I'm like, I, yeah, it just looks like he walked into a substantially shittier diner than he was yeah, in. Yeah, and that, the like, world. there's nothing, it's not creative, and then Freddy's just there. It's like, this is all <laughs> you fucking got? Like, you came back from the grave to torment me, and this is the best you can fucking do? Yeah. Like, right, you know, right. Like, the original Nightmare on Elm Street, they've got, like, fucking crazy shit. You know, she's going up the stairs, and they turn to goop, and then there's yeah, the right. that's when he comes out of the wall. Like, there's some really inventive shit. Like, Nightmare on Elm Street 3 opens, it's one of my favorite openings. This She's running through a house... And there's children hanging from nooses, like mm -hmm. like a room filled with them. And she's running through them. And they're they're swinging back and forth, and the floor is tar. It's like really right. fucking nuts. Yeah. Like you know you're in Dream World, and this it's like oh you probably shouldn't have gone to Waffle House at three in the morning, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like, even like Nightmare on Elm Street too, where like Freddy like takes a bus and like drives them into the desert and then they're just like like balancing on like a rock on the school bus like right. that's that's so fun yeah it's like crazy crazy shit you know that's what makes those movies great and they just didn't have it and then like i said they just took the most the, like such generic sequences of like suspense and then you know his one-liners man when he when she goes when chris goes outside and the dog is dead he goes i was just uh, petting him yeah what right the fuck is that it's like that's yeah okay. Yeah, because Mike and I were saying specifically, like, his voice felt really, like, off, you know? Yeah. Like, it seems like they weren't trying to go, again, with this, like, kind of over-the-top, like, cheesiness of the original. But, like, if you're not going to do that, and if you are going to try to do, quote-unquote, like, creepy voice, <laughs> then you can't be doing the, like, one-liners, right? Oh, no, like, exactly. They need to pick a Freddy. Either Serious Freddy from, like, 1 and 2 or Goofball Freddy from 3 through, you know, 6. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine, but pick one and stick to it. Exactly. Like the fucking the line, my favorite line. I say this all the time. It drives my girlfriend crazy. So I always come up to her and, I, and she like I'll I'll like come out and like scare her since I'm an asshole and I do it all the time, and she'll scream and I go, "Why are you screaming? I haven't even caught you yet." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. That's the thing. You got to pick that or serious Freddy. You can't like try to do both. Well, especially because Freddy is now a pedophile, so it's like you're yes. Really, oh right. my god. Okay. Right. Really going down like this is dark, Freddy. So, yeah. You really, you know, the one-liners don't really fit when it's like, oh, by the way, Freddy is a, a kid toucher. D 
Did you right. know he touched kids? Here's some photographs of him touching kids. Yeah, oh yeah, God. right. Okay, so this is okay. Let, let's keep this plot moving on because I want to get to that, and I, I have I have some things to say about it. But uh, so she goes to look for the photos. She goes into the attic. Oh my God, Freddy's here for some reason. And then she wakes up in her bed. After she wakes up in her bed, Mom is like, "Bye, I gotta go," or something like that. And uh, then she runs into um, um, boyfriend, the ex boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, the one who was jealous at the diner. He shows up at her bedroom window and mm-hmm. like startles her, and she's like, "What the heck?" And he <laughs> he comes on in, and uh, he's like, "What's going on?" And she starts to explain to him, you know, disclose to him that she's been having these dreams about a dude with like knives on his fingers. And at the same time, he goes knives on his yeah. fingers. <laughs> and this is when they discover that they've been having dreams of the same people, yeah. which uh, or person. She's like, oh, my God. Then we're both having uh, dreams of the same guy. And he's, he's the guy kill who killed Dean and he's going to kill me and I can't fall asleep at all. Otherwise, I'm going to die. And then it's like, stay here and sleep with me in the same bed tonight. And he's like, yeah, I think I'll do that. <laughs> and so then they do that. She goes to sleep, and uh, lo and behold, she runs into Freddy. They butchered the most infamous scene from the original, which is Tina getting lifted into the air and dragged yeah. across yeah. the ceiling upside down as she's being slashed. And instead, Freddy just, like, fucking WWFs her around the room, <laughs> slices her stomach open, and then it's just, that's it. And I'm like, oh, wow, that was fucking lame. You have... Yeah. Like the best part of the original is when Tina like smacks Rod while she's just like yeah, spinning through the air. Phenomenal effects in the original. They built a room that was rotating, like it was crazy. And this one, oh, like, man. Oh, let's right. just have a wire stunt. It's like okay. <laughs> but yeah, they, she gets spun around. She gets split open, and then a uh, good old boyfriend is now covered in the blood. And he's like, "Oh God, I'm covered in blood." And then he <laughs> checks her pulse for some reason, and then he decides to run out of the house, uh, covered in blood. And then a neighbor, I guess, calls the police. Um, and he decides that the best course of action is to go to Nancy's house. So he, uh, I guess, climbs in through the window. I don't know how the hell he got into this room. But he comes into this room and, like, covers her mouth and is like, oh, it's, it's me. I'm covered in blood, but don't worry about it. Um, I didn't kill, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, Chris, by the way. She's like, I understand. But then the cops actually do, like, uh, show up. Mm-hmm. Just surrounding the house uh, because they understand that he's at Nancy's house somehow. Yeah. Uh, car plates, maybe? Yeah, I don't sure, know. Sure Whatever. Not. Anyway, he gets arrested, and the whole time he's like, I didn't kill her. You got to believe me, man. I didn't kill her. I didn't do nothing. And the cops, very true to life, are like, we don't care. And <laughs> Slam him against the hood of the car. Yes, exactly. Shut the hell up. Right. After he gets arrested, he dies in jail. Yes. That's pretty much the long and short of it. He Yeah, he goes into jail. <laughs> Or he, yeah, he's like in the jail cell, and you know he's like having his whole uh, like, oh, I can't go to sleep, can't go to sleep, yeah. and his roommate's like, shut the hell up, yeah, or his right. cellmate, or I I'll guess. I'll kill they, you myself. Yeah, uh, which I hope that he says those words exactly because uh, then um, some amount of time later, whether it's uh, the next scene or whatever, as Mike said, this kid eats it. Uh, Freddy Krueger comes and finishes the job while he's in the jail cell. And uh, his cellmate uh, then has to plead uh, to the rest of the the jail that uh, he did not, in fact, do it. There's a bit where Nancy and uh, and Smile Cop start Quentin. being like, "What, Quentin? 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 Where, Quentin? <laughs> where Nancy and Quentin mm-hmm. uh, start being like, what could the connection be between like Dean, yeah. Susie? What's her name? Chris, I think actually. Chris, uh, uh, Dean." Chris, me and you be, and like Nancy like asks her mom like, "There's no connection between like Chris, Dean, me, and uh, Quentin here." And is her there? mom's like, "Not nope, at all. Nope. It'd be silly to think otherwise." Really, this is is where they they like basically they they do more or less the same conversation that she had with the dude who eats it in jail of like, "Yeah, I've been having these nightmares about a," and then the uh, then he like finishes her sentence of "guy with a sweater," and then it's like, "Oh." <gasps> Yeah, and that's between Susie and dude who's in jail now. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that this this interaction now in the Nancy cafe and Smile with Cop have yeah, it. it it's more or less like copy and pasted that, but have them in a cafe. I feel like they have like books or something, and they're like, I've been looking up like insomnia and like yeah sleep. Well, I, I feel because I, I feel like they come to that conclusion after where they're like, uh, oh, we're gonna get like murked. And then they have to be like, oh, yeah, like now it's getting to the point where 
it's not just when we are asleep that we're not safe because we're getting so sleep deprived that we're going to start like basically almost crossing into like the dream world because yeah, we're like micro naps. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. But then she with Quentin, uh, then like sneak into like her mother's study or whatever. And they're like looking around <laughs> for right, stuff. Right. Um, and they like open this like sock drawer basically. And they find that there's nothing in the sock drawer. So then they try to close it, but then it's not closing. And, you know, they're like, what the hell? To which I said to, to you when we were watching this, like, wouldn't that happen every time the mother opens the sock drawer then? Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that, that that seems like a... Dumb? A bit, uh, yeah, it, it seems does like seem a dumb. dumb. It does and, seem like uh, a dumb, doesn't and, it? Yeah, so they're like, huh, let's see why this sock drawer isn't closing. So they take out the sock drawer, and lo and behold, there's, like, a manila envelope with, like... Uh, I don't remember what it says, but it might as well say, like, uh, uh, information that you're looking for. Yeah, right, right. (laughs) And so then uh, Nancy um, opens this, and lo and behold, it's a picture of um, her preschool class. Yep. Which, there's Quentin, there's Chris, there's... uh, um, Dean. Dean, Mm -hmm. and a bunch of other people who don't matter. And she's like, what? I don't understand. Uh, and then uh, her mother like walks into the room. It's like, <gasps> well, for, well, first off, uh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry, you're I'm fine. Sorry, I'm sorry, but uh, they don't even recognize it as them on the back of the oh, photo. Yeah. <laughs> it's like names in each place where the kids are, and they flip it over because you know. Yeah, no, like, you're totally right. It's a photo of a bunch of kids outside of kindergarten. What's going on here? And then they flip it over, and they're like, <gasps> Dean, Chris, <laughs> yeah. Quentin. No, you're absolutely right. I forgot about that. And yeah, so then her mother comes in and is like, <gasps> "What are you doing? You shouldn't be looking at that." Uh, and then um, yep. she more or less is like, "Why did you hide this from me, mom?" And then uh, the mom's like, "I was trying to protect you." Yeah, because mom's like, well, "I never want you to have to relive those memories ever again." And I don't know if this is when Nancy's like, "What memories? Wait a minute!" Or all <laughs> <laughs> oh, the memories are <laughs> yeah. coming back. I don't like, know if that happens. Yeah. I feel like it might happen. <laughs> it might not. But it feels like the movie's not above that. Yeah. But um, yeah. That's more or less it. Um, and and the mom kind of I feel like gives like a brief overview in the kitchen. Yes. Maybe, yes. She's like, like, look, here's the deal. And we start getting like flashback scenes. As- oh, Freddy Krueger. He was such a nice fella who yeah. just loved the children. Yeah. A little too much. Uh-huh. And uh, and then we're the, so that's that's generally the the. And then there's like a, <laughs> a little super cut of like kids being like, oh, she's just acting weird today. I don't know what's going on. And like her being like, he'll take us to his secret cave. Yeah. And like. And uh, and and boy, they they don't pull any punches. I, uh, <laughs> and then, and like one of the scenes is like a girl with like Freddy Krueger's like claw marks, like you know the gloves yeah. with the like across her back, and the parents are kind of like she's acting kind of strange. She's pretty weird. Was yeah. going like, not, a, not at that point. None of them are like, "Whoa, what the sweet fuck." But yeah, so that's that's basically the long and short of it. And uh, they were like, "Well, what happened to him?" It's kind of like he's gone. Don't worry about it. Exactly. Yeah. She says that, and she's like, "So like." You don't need to worry about him. He's gone, and he's not coming back. And uh, and they are not uh, put at ease at this. Because I, I think they, they're not, like, telling Nancy's mom, like, hey, we're having these dreams, and we're, like, yeah, haunted by Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm. The mom's kind of like, oh, that's a horrible part of your life. You've successfully repressed the memory, so let's not go, like, <laughs> yeah. pulling those up right now. Which I guess is, I I guess I'd say uh, you could propose that as a kind of solution for dealing with trauma. We're just like, look, you've repressed it pretty well so far. Like, why why dig it up at this point? You'll just always walk with like a hunch as you've embodied the tension from your repression. So you know, like your back will always be a bit tighter than it ought to be. But you know, all things considered, uh, they have more experiences with Freddie, I guess. So Quentin is uh, at gym class, and they're going swimming in the pool. And uh, right. <laughs> and I'm while they're swimming right. in the pool, uh, Quentin, I guess, manages to fall asleep while swimming and then uh, gets dragged to the bottom of this pool where he then emerges in a puddle of water in a uh, very uh, dark, industrial-looking place. And so he gets out, and then he sees a man running for his life. And uh, we might be able to recognize this man as uh, pre-burn Freddy Krueger uh, from the flashbacks earlier. And... Uh, this man is running for his life, being chased by uh, several cars, and uh, he manages to uh, duck away into this building where he's like uh, trying his best to keep everybody out. 
and uh, you know the whole crowd is like, "All right, Kruger, we're gonna kill you for touching our kids." And then he's just like, "I, I didn't do anything. Yeah, I didn't do right, anything." Yeah, right. Uh, they're like, "We're not buying it." And long and short of it, they're like, "All right, we're gonna mob this dude to death." And they throw um, like a Molotov cocktail of uh, of a gas can um, through the window, yeah. which then causes an explosion and fire. And then uh, we see Mr. Kruger himself run from the building covered in flames. Uh, and he runs straight for Quentin, who, when he reaches Quentin, Quentin wakes up uh, and is being resuscitated because he almost drowned. Quentin is doing the swim practice thing, and Nancy is using the school computers yeah, to right. like look up uh, the kids in the photos. And she's like, all the kids in the photos died in their sleep mysteriously, except for this. Well, they're not except for. They're like, there's this one kid who was doing like a video log. Like, let's let, let me check out um, the, the video log. Uh, I forget his name. Anyway, either, yeah. so this is kid, and he's kind of like, I'm doing a video log. I've been having these sh- strange dreams. A uh, man in a striped sweater <laughs> coming to find me. I think he's gonna kill me. I can't sleep. If I sleep. I'll I'm die. dead. Yeah. I'll die. Let's get this going. Yeah. I'll die. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, the next video clip is him, like, asleep and, like, <laughs> dying or whatever. Sure. But, like, he gives the necessary exposition at some point where he's just like, <laughs> he's just like, I'm having uh, visions of this man in a striped sweater. I attended kindergarten <laughs> at a school in, like, blankety blank state. Yeah, and he also probably does, like, a- again, the further, uh, like, thing on the micro naps thing of, like, I, I'm starting to see things because I haven't been sleeping. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so. They- oh, oh, he's kind of like, oh, here's my dream. Yeah. Like, Freddy, mm-hmm. like, takes me, like, to the school. Like, he wants to show me something at the school. I don't know what the deal is with that or something. Yeah. And then he dies, like, on camera. Yeah, something to that effect. Yep. Uh, And so then I think it's at this point uh, that maybe they have a scene where, like, he and Nancy are like, I'm not so sure about, like, this story that we have been told by her parents. Uh, Regardless of whether they have that conversation or not, the two of them go to Quentin's father, Mr. Krabs, the principal, and uh, they're like, we know what you did to Freddy Krueger. You murdered him, mob justice style. And he's just like, keep your voices down. Yeah, right. We did it to protect you. And uh, do you have any idea what he was doing to you kids? Has this movie not said it clearly enough what Freddy Krueger was doing to you children? Uh, uh, to which then they were like, we were kids. We could have been making that up. Did you ever find any actual evidence that he did this? Uh, to which Mr. Krabs is like, uh, next question. Yeah, <laughs> and right. And then the, they come to the conclusion of like, they they murdered Freddy Krueger and he was completely innocent. That's why he's coming after us to get his revenge for his uh, mob justice killing. And then, I don't know what for what reason, but I'm Nancy ends up going to the hospital. I'm trying for me to remember yeah. why she goes to the hospital. I I cannot think of it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I can only assume that it's like in the original where her mother is like, I'm worried about you. Like, let's go to the doctor and do this sleep test to, like, see what's going on. Um, sleep test? Uh, why does that not ring a bell to me at all? Yeah. I mean, it, again, I don't remember that scene being in here, but I, I I know that's what they did in the first one. And I know she ends up being in the hospital here. Right. Uh, but anyway, all the same, she's in the hospital uh, where she herself has an encounter with Freddy Krueger and then um, is fine. <laughs> she does not be, uh, she does not get killed by Freddy Krueger. And uh, then, uh, like, <laughs> more or less, her mother and this nurse, like, pull, like, the, the curtain, like, to give themselves some privacy. Um, you know, like, those curtains that hang from, like, the ceiling at, like, a hospital, yes. like, around the bed. Yes. They more or less, like... <laughs> close that curtain and they're like all right we need to make sure that under no circumstances she gets out of our sight oh, right, uh, right, and, yeah. and we'll be able to monitor her like, and right let her now. get to sleep like, and they're right like, yeah let's okay cool let's go make sure that she is still in bed <laughs> uh, uh. <laughs> and lo and behold nancy has left and uh we then see her and quentin uh in quentin's car we're gonna go and investigate this freddy krueger thing further Quentin reveals that while they were in the hospital, he managed to steal some raw adrenaline uh, to keep them safe from Freddy Krueger. I guess Quentin uh, 
is like prescribed some kind of medication. No, it's uh, like Adderall. Okay, there we go. Yeah, so he, he's it's he, not Adderall, but it's like Adderall. Yeah, like it's he, a he is prescribed a, a stimulant type drug, and um, clearly they have been like abusing this to be able to not die by Freddy Krueger. Yes. Uh, and so Quentin goes to his pharmacy, uh, and Nancy stays in the car, and um, Quentin more or less uh, goes to the pharmacist and is like looking very much like somebody who should definitely not be given a prescription of uh, a stimulant. And uh, he's just like, hey, doc, I need my prescription. As he scratches neck and exactly. forearm. Yeah, and uh, the doctor uh, very cordially is like, uh, I can't do that for you, Quentin. Uh, and Quentin's like, uh, no, you really got to do this He's for like, hey, me. Man, every other pharmacist has been real cool about it. <laughs> yeah. Why are you being whack? Yeah, and and the pharmacist is just like, you got to get out of here. I, right. I'm not going to help you. Right. And so Quentin accepts his defeat. Uh, and while Quentin is accepting his <laughs> defeat, uh, Nancy is in the car, and uh, she seems to be um, unsure as to whether she is asleep or awake, and uh, things are looking kind of eerie. So she decides to test if she is awake uh, uh, by uh, burning her arm with the cigarette lighter. Right. Uh, which, as we soon learn, is all for naught because uh, whether or not that was a test to see if she was awake, uh, to which she clearly passed and she was awake, right. uh, that didn't stop Freddy Krueger from uh, creeping up on her. Nope. So I think she probably, like, in the car, like, sees him and is like, ah! I have to get out of the car. And so she gets out of the car and runs into the pharmacy where Quentin is. And uh, she is having uh, probably one of the coolest uh, sequences in this movie, uh, which unfortunately isn't saying much, uh, where she is like running from Freddy Krueger as like the the world kind of keeps shifting back and forth from uh, Freddy Krueger nightmare world. And this pharmacy that she's in in the real world, yep. and uh, and he's slashing at her and knocking stuff over as you might expect Freddy to do, and yep. uh, yeah, he cuts up her arm and she manages to like grab like a part of his sweater that rips, and then once the whole ordeal is over and she is uh, firmly in the real world and not in the dream world anymore, and Freddy is nowhere to be seen. She realizes that she is holding uh, the piece of the sweater that she ripped off, indicating that there is some way to uh, bring things back from this dream world. And so, Quentin discovers her, uh, having uh, been slashed in the arm by Freddy and uh, laying on the floor of this, uh, of this uh, pharmacy. And uh, they grab some bandages and gauze and get the hell out of there. Yep. At that point, they're like, oh, okay, so like I get it now. Um, based on what we've found in the library about these other kids and the connection that we all share and what we think we've discovered about Freddy Krueger being uh, murdered for um, an unjust cause, he's trying to like get us back to the preschool. Like he wants to show us something. Like maybe it will be like evidence that he was uh, framed or something. Like that's why he's doing this. Um, and they go to the preschool, and uh, it's all uh, de- abandoned and decrepit. Um. I guess the whole Freddy Krueger thing was not good for business. Basically, they, like, wander around and uh, almost immediately are like, hey, look, here's this thing that uh, presumably every single other person who's looked into this has not been able to find. The secret hatch into his secret cave. Um. And so they they go into this cave uh, to which they find... uh, Pretty much the exact opposite of what they expected to find, uh, that being um, evidence that would um, uh, w- would prove Freddy's innocence. Uh, but in fact, it is a lot of very, very incriminating evidence. Yeah. Um, and so upon finding this incriminating evidence, they realize that, oh my God, our parents didn't murder a man who they believed to uh, have been molesting children. They murdered a man who actually was molesting children. And furthermore, for some reason, outside of just molesting these children, was creating finger knives to, I guess, scratch them with for some reason. Exactly. And so, yeah, Yeah. so they they break down and and, uh, have a very emotional uh, response to this, as you might expect. Um, Considering that a lot of them center around Nancy. Yeah. Um, And so they then are like, all right, like, Let's come up with a plan, and that plan is that I, Nancy, 
I'm going to go to sleep. All right, plan over. Uh, good night. <laughs> More or less. Yeah, she's <laughs> For all like, intents and purposes. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go to sleep, and then I'm going to bring him back with me. Right. And then I guess we'll mob justice him again. <laughs> yeah. Um, and yeah, so Quentin's like, all right, like that, that sounds like a plan. I'm going to go shoot myself up with this adrenaline so I don't fall asleep. Right. Uh, and so, yeah, so they do that, and Nancy goes to sleep. Meanwhile, Quentin's yeah. like, what am I going to use as a weapon? Oh, here's like a paper cutter. And then he breaks off like the arm of the paper cutter and uses it as like a pseudo machete. Yeah. And then takes his post in his guard chair and promptly falls asleep. <laughs> Despite the adrenaline that he just took. Yeah. Yeah. I think she falls asleep and she's like looking for him, uh, but is not having much luck. And then meanwhile, Quentin does his Quentin thing and then he falls asleep. And then Quentin runs into Freddy who is like, I'm going to fuck you up, and also I'm going to then go kill your girlfriend. <laughs> I think he might stab Quentin, but not fatally. Um, and then Nancy, I guess, runs into Freddy and is like, hey, you, why don't you go pick on someone your own size or something? Uh, and so then, I don't know, they, they do their thing, um, and then one way or another, they find themselves in a bedroom where uh, Freddie more or less just like ties her down to this bed and uh, is basically like, ooh, hoo, hoo, I'm going to do some uh, n- not so great things to you. Right. And uh, you, I, I specifically waited this long to have our interaction because you're so sleep deprived that you're more or less going to fall into a coma and I can do this forever or at least as long as I want to. <laughs> yeah, right. And she's like, no. No! Uh, and then Quentin wakes up and uh, I guess more or less like looks over and sees Nancy on the bed just being like, no, no. Yeah, right. uh, and uh, so Freddie, I guess, uh, does some stuff and is ready to deliver the killing blow or at least stab her through the chest. Uh, and Quentin decides that the, uh, the best way to um, wake her is to take his second shot of raw adrenaline and just pump it right into her chest, um, Pulp Fiction style. Okay. And she wakes up, and then uh, Freddy is like on top of her because she like pulled him through the the dream world. Right. Uh, to which, yeah. Then they're like, "Oh my God, Freddy Krueger is in the real world now." I'm. G- I think S- Quentin does get stabbed in the dream world, but I'm pretty sure again, like <laughs> in the like real world, they're like fighting, and Quentin like I just I can't remember. Probably tries to do something, and then Freddy's like, "Oh ho ho." No, you don't. And then, like, gives him a stab. And then Quentin's like, oh, God, you stabbed me. And then um, uh, Nancy, I guess, uses this opportunity to take the, the blade that they fashioned and right. cut his head off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I think they burn the place afterwards. I suppose, you know, my whole thing was, like, for a man who's been, like, burned to death mm-hmm. and is pretty old at this point <laughs> and just came from the dream world, like, he's surprisingly spry and strong. Yeah, which so in the real world that is. I yeah, mean, in the dream world, I guess it makes sense. But yeah, in the real he, world, he's the, uh, he gets to uh, right. do all. I that mean, I guess stuff. it's the case in like the real first movie too, because yeah. he has enough strength to do like <laughs> and like chase Nancy around. I I, I don't know what Freddy Krueger is. Yeah, you no know, clue. like because no I I guess you know like it could kind of make sense that like in the dream world, like you say, you know, he's like a being of dreams and has unlimited power and whatever the hell. Sure. But then in the real world, he takes like a corporeal form, and you know maybe that that isn't there. But you know from from what we've seen, it seems that he just like is Freddy Krueger no right. matter where he is. Right. Um. So, all the same, they they murk him. Then uh, Nancy like comes home, um, and uh, is like talking with her mother, who I, I don't think that we've really like played it up enough. Uh, our mother's kind of shitty in this whole ordeal. Mm-hmm. Um. And yeah, she's just uh, not not very cool about the whole thing. Yeah, no. and uh, yeah. So basically, when Nancy comes home and she runs into her mother, and uh, she's like, "Mom, I forgive you for everything," and the mom's just like, "Oh, honey, thank you. You know, I'm just looking out for you." And then like the mother like steps in front of a mirror. Nancy sees uh, in the reflection of the mirror, Freddy Krueger is in the mirror. And then stabs her mother through the face, mm-hmm. through the mirror, and uh, the movie ends. Yep. And then 2010's uh, probably like new metal esque, like <laughs> credit school. Sure. I'm in. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, that, that's that's this movie. Wow, that's a film that you don't want to wait a week to talk about. <laughs> oh God, no! Yeah, <laughs> God, Lord, in one ear out the other, man. Yep. God, what a hollow film. Let's talk about Freddy being a pedophile. Oh, because <laughs> you would have opened strong, huh? Yeah. Okay. So this is it's it's so mind boggling to me because like original Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, unless there is a, a just some subtext that I completely missed, he just kills kids. He he has. <laughs> He has no rhyme or reason aside from from liking to kill kids. Well, he kills kids and then one kid's mother at the end. That's true. Yes. Oh, there is a lot of I feel like you don't generally get a child killer with minus like the child molester part. I think that when the movie came out, that was probably not like the most kosher thing to put into a film. Yeah. Right. Um, but it definitely there's a lot of more so in the later sequels, there's definitely a lot of implication um, yeah. of that sort of thing like seeing Freddy lick the back of a photograph of a kid and stick it into a scrapbook or say, yeah. you're all my children now. Like there's, it's there. It's just right. not even in the original. There is like clearly some, some stuff like when he like licks her through the phone and stuff. And yeah, like, I, he yeah, does yeah, say yeah, like, I am but even yeah. still, I guess, I guess my point being it, that's, that's not really even so much the point I want to make. So in this movie, they, they definitely much more explicitly say that he, he is a like, predator uh, whatever I, I mean I, i'm not like they made ch- pretty a, a child predator instead of a child killer like i'm not i don't really care about that villain is too villainous for me <laughs> but what, <laughs> what what does like blow my mind and i just like i i almost want to like sit down with the writers and be like please like i, I want to know like why did you do this is why did they have the whole like tangent of like oh wait a second we were wrong we were just kids and we made it up. Freddie didn't actually do all that. And then for them to back, like, be like, oh, wait, no, he totally did. Because, you know, it it is, I'll admit, it's like, it would be an interesting enough thing for it to be like, oh, no, these kids, like, were being kids and they just said stuff that wasn't true. Like, that that's an interesting twist to the whole Freddy narrative. But why add that in there if that is not the case? Well, that's the thing. I actually really like that. I'm like, oh, shit, they're questioning whether or not he actually did it. And I'm like, man, that would make a lot of sense why this guy is now coming back yeah. to kill his kids. Like, that's fucked. Especially, like, given, like, modern politics. Yeah. That would be really interesting for, like, you know, it's like this was a false accusation. It's like, oh, shit. Yeah, but, you know, I, it was not too far removed to say that, like, an actual lynch mob of townspeople is any different than, like, a Twitter lynch mob. Yeah, right. no, absolutely. 2010, so I don't think they really had the foresight for that or the intelligent writing. But, <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah, for him to say, like, oh, my God, we were wrong. And then it's like, oh, here's a bunch of polaroids of him molesting you. <laughs> yeah, like, oh, right, God. right. Oh, yeah, no, never mind. It was exactly right. Yeah, no, I mean, you're so right because, like, it is a really interesting thing. Like, I... I, I don't I don't dislike that at all. Like you say, I mean, especially now, it's really relevant. Like with with the current like uh, climate of politics, I guess. But like, but yeah, like w- what reason? Like what what compels you to to be like ah? Just kidding. <laughs> it's I think it was a red herring, a half baked red herring, or it was a major plot point that they just cut out of the script mostly and just left that little snippet in there because it's i don't know it's it's very strange it's like they almost tried to make him a sympathetic character because then like he's actually getting burned yeah he actually right. is like i don't know what you think i did but i didn't do it and like it's like oh my right. god it's horrible it's like right. oh no he was totally fucking putting the blocks for these kids like no yeah no. right again not great movie as it is i think that's the thing i dislike the most it feels so wishy-washy yeah, well, it definitely pissed a lot of people off when it came out. I remember horror fans being, like, mortified that they made Freddy, like, a pedophile. They're like, no, he was a child <laughs> killer in the original. And it's, right, right, right. Yeah, it's a difference. Got, it's like, you've got this guy tattooed on you and you're wearing the t-shirt. Let's, think, <laughs> let's unpack this for a moment. Okay for this deformed janitor to be murdering children. Right. You can't be sexually abusing them. That's just too ugly. Yeah, right. There, it is interesting that that line is it's like. Well, Jason can slaughter the innocent, you know, mercilessly. That's completely fine, but we can't have him be icky. That's just yeah, wrong. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean that is actually that that is a, a very interesting point with uh, just like I, again. I mean, you like to see these these characters like they're icons. I mean, Michael Myers. You know, like uh, 
you you root for Michael Myers killing people, and you right. wear the T-shirt for Michael Michael Myers because it's fun to watch him kill people. But it's like it'd be very not fun to see like a, a, an abuse scene that happened with these characters. So right. it is interesting because it's like it, it's not like murder is okay in the real world, right. and and you know there's definitely like faux murder on screen is right. totally cool. But it's it's weird though because like assault in that manner is not the same way because like assault is both terrible in the real world and also usually in really bad taste when it's done in like a movie you know right I you know and I don't know what it is about like killing somehow feeling more like uh you know like uh <laughs> simple and clean in so far as like the the crimes that slashers can commit because there is like a needle you have to thread with like people who are gonna be your uh kind of like killer in a slasher film in that they have to be somebody that presents a sense of danger, but you still want to see the antics they're involved with, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so, like, it's, it's kind of hard to be like, oh, this guy's a serial rapist. Anyone want to see him do some antics? And it's like, no, no, I don't want to see any antics. That was actually the point I was about to make. If you literally took the slasher formula and just replaced murder with rape. Yeah. yeah. Wildly <laughs> uncomfortable. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, I've never really thought about it until this moment, but it's one hundred percent true. I'd be like, ah, oh, I, I don't know like, if I want to watch that's, that's I don't this genre of film yeah. anymore. That's icky. Yeah. Nobody wants to see that. Although I would, I would say Michael Myers. Mm-hmm. Opening time, the first time we see Michael Myers as a child spying on his sister while she's undressing, and he's yep. like, yeah. Kevin. So it's like yeah. there's some ick going on there too. Oh yeah. We were all kids once. I think we've all murdered our sister while she was undressing. <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously. I mean, come on, guys. Yeah. But Who has it? <laughs> like, no one remembers, like, that stuff. And it's like, oh, that's weird. Yeah, um, right. Jason, it, depending on which, which mythology you ascribe to, if he actually was the drowned little boy, like, he died and came back, that means that there is an eight-year-old busted in on you boning and then he's like <laughs> ripping you apart. Like, that's fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> Man, anybody who regularly views uh, our, our episodes is probably getting real tired of Michael Myers talk. We've been doing a lot of Michael Myers talk this month. I, ugh. Not a fan. <laughs> Not a fan. I, see, I, uh, I, I don't want to get too off topic, but I, I love the original, but oh, God. I like, I love to hate everything that's not the original. Back to, to, to Kid Toucher Freddy. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, the lengths they go to. They could have been, like, they could have had the flashbacks where he's playing with the kids, and then it's like, oh, and then have cut to the kid. Like, he took us down to, like, the basement of the secret place. Right. Then they go on to have the scene where Jack Girl Haley's like, yeah, that's a really good picture. I've got some good pictures in the basement. If you can keep right. the secret, maybe you can fix them. And I'm like, I don't need to see him, like, grooming children. Yeah, right. right. Yeah, yeah, no, that's totally like, all right, I, I like, I get where this is going. We don't need to keep. Yeah, then, then they show him in the fucking, like, rape room, like, different. Right. And then that's... they have the Polaroids, like, Jesus Christ, I get it. He's a fucking. Yeah. yeah, which, that's another thing, too. So, like, in the flashback scene where they are, like, in, like, the cave, as they call it, they're just, like, they have, like, a bucket of red paint that they're, like, flicking on the wall. And, and the little girl is, like, covered in it like her dress and stuff like when the kids go to the parents and the parents are like something was different like right, they were right. like the kids are acting strange they weren't like my kid came home covered in potentially blood or red paint just like all over her dress and body like i well and that's so it's parents are... because then when you see clancy brown he's like on the phone with the other parents they're like yeah the kids are acting weird it's like okay again we get it they were weird. <laughs> yeah. then it shows them like lifting up the little girl's shirt and showing her back with the claw. Yeah. Like, oh my right. fucking god, I get it. Yeah. Why are right. we now yeah. showing like the bare back of like a six year old girl? Like, I think we understand what you're implying. Right. Like, <laughs> it just doesn't need to be there. It's just, it keeps beating you over the head with it. It really does. I One thing though that I do want to note that I really love is that uh, in, in the moment where um, Quentin and uh, Nancy like confront Clancy Brown and they're like, you killed him? I really love that, like, because this is when they still believe that, like, Freddy has been, like, falsely, like, lynch mobbed, basically. Um, and and uh, Quentin is like, so you found the room, right? And Clancy Brown's just like, 
<laughs> like, uh, what? <laughs> uh, there is no investigation of any kind. And also, what the fuck is the the notice of Freddy making his fucking fingernail or his, his glove? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's As true. In the basement, it's like what the fuck? Like right, right, right. Like a garden trowel with like or a garden rake in one scene. I'm like, oh, maybe that's the that's what it's supposed to be. But like. Oh, by the way, I make my own handmade torture devices, too. I'm not <laughs> killing these kids. I'm just molesting them. But I also yeah. made this, like, freaky-ass, like, knife glove. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It's like them, like, doing, like, the, the like, cuts on the girl's back and whatever. It's like, what exactly is the... Imp- like, he's starting with just, like bog standard molestation and escalating into like torture like what is what is like the fucking implication here and again how is it the the kids acting weird that is the the tip-off point how do you not notice that like your daughter has like foot-long scars (laughs) on her back (laughs) they're like "Hmm." (laughs) man these kids on the playground are rough Rough these days (laughs) i just i don't understand and then what made freddy come back like why did he start his reign of terror now right. when did he why didn't he like it makes more sense if he's a pedophile wouldn't he want to come back right away and get these kids because then he could right. really get them you know right. as opposed to like he's like oh you still smell just as good or something like yeah right that's like again a very heavy like pedophile yeah. joke but it's, or comment but she's like 19 now so it's like oh is this still like your thing like, yeah. Right, yeah right, now right, she's right. just like a hot college student. Like, what? Mm-hmm. I, I I'm getting mixed signals here, dude. Like, why wait until they're adults to then like? He's like, yeah. Now like you're in a coma, so now I can molest you forever. <laughs> right. Like, right. I'm like, okay. Like, why wouldn't you want it when she? I mean, not that I'm hoping, yeah, not that I'm <laughs> advocating for this like, scene. Yeah. Right. I just yeah, I, but I just given the character's motivation. Talking. Right. <laughs> right. It, it would it would seem like it would be more sensible for Freddy Krueger canonically in this film to yeah. be haunting whoever that age range of children are in the town right now, you know? Yes. Like that's that's what it would seem to be making sense for this guy <sighs> as opposed to the ones that uh he tormented in the first place just revisiting. Which I guess also again to I, I guess to further dive into his uh his motives here. The characters, you know, they start to get this assumption again before they realize that he was in fact a, a molester. That, like, oh, he's coming after us because, like, we wrongly accused him and caused his death. Right. And, and you know, then once they realize that that, like, is not the case, they're like, oh, he's coming after us because we rightly accused him of his death. But I guess by that same logic, then, why isn't he, like, going after the parents? That's exactly right. – well, the idea of the original was that he's like, I'm going to – get back at you by taking your kids where the period you can't protect them so like that's right. like the ultimate like gotcha but in this right. it really is like i feel like he's really like having a grand old time like creeping up on these kids again so, yeah, yeah right like, right what are, you, what are you what are you doing i actually i i do really love that in the original they're like why didn't he get uh like charged for all these child murders it's like oh somebody signed the warrant on the wrong line all of its time like that was a big deal like that sort of shit was happening i mean it still happens now but like that was yeah. a big, all of west craven's movies are very political that was a very big political thing to make a little more sense right. um i like, guess looking at it from a modern lens though it's like huh really <laughs> yeah but i mean that is still a thing like my brother's oh yeah no absolutely and, like you can get off on technicalities and it's infuriating that that's oh, yeah, the, the police and the judicial system as a whole are <laughs> pretty not good and the worst part is police can't protect you in your dreams. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's what this feeling is really. Yeah. yeah, we see that in, in the remake and the original. That uh, Even in a maximum security prison, Freddy has no problem uh, going yeah. in into Go, those walls. Right yeah. To town. Yeah. yeah, and you know, that's, that's kind of a, a further problem of like, because like you say, with like uh, the original being pretty competent at setting up uh, all the characters we're introduced to and giving us a, a bit of familiarity... It seems like of the five kind of main, uh, you know, uh, Ish characters. yeah, that would be the kind of victims of Freddy in this movie. Within the first like third of the movie, three of those characters are killed off very quickly to set up this kind of like chain of events slash like convincing part for the final two characters to be like, oh man, we're dealing with something really serious. Us two got to figure this out, and so. They had very uh, kind of rushed introductories and killings of the first three people so that the last two characters could be like, I feel like something's going on here. <laughs> and then like start to like look into it, you know? 
Yeah, I don't know. This it's the, the the narrative structure of this movie is all over the fucking place. It really feels like there was a much longer movie and they just trimmed out entire segments of it. Yeah. Like, very puzzlingly so. But I because I don't understand most of the characters' motivations. I sure as fuck don't understand Freddy's motivation. And then at the end, the the like uh the reveal that you can pull things out of the dream world into the real world, like that was a big moment in the original, and they actually like kind of explained like all this stuff and they set it up and then like Nancy sets like all these traps and they do this whole thing. Yeah, like right. that's uh, I love that was that. badass. Yeah. I was like fucked up home alone. It, yeah, right, yeah, I, I, yeah, I always say I'm like, yeah, Freddie got home alone. Like, you know, but then you watch like the new one and it's like, what's their plan? It's like, oh yeah, here's a here's like a fucking paper cutter. Like yeah. get him. Yeah. That's what I was okay. saying to Mike. Was what like I, I, like if I made that it would literally it would end where she goes to sleep and they have some plan to wake her up. Right, mm-hmm. she right. grabs Freddy, wakes him up, and he's like, "Oh, what do you?" And they just shoot him. <laughs> yeah. and then the movie just stops. Like, oh, I guess he's dead now. Right. And then the police come. They're like, "What the fuck? Who is this random burn dude you murdered?" <laughs> like, this right, right. Yeah, see that. That's what I was saying to Mike. Was like when they do like wake her up and like Freddy Krueger is on top of her. I was like, how is this better? Like he's in the real world, but like he still poses like. Just as much as a threat with his his finger knives, right? Yeah. Yeah. And also, like, I, I I get that you you know they're they're trying to figure out what to do. They don't know what will stop Freddy uh, indefinitely. But even still, it's like you know the whole reason we're in this predicament is because Freddy was killed. Right. So what leads us to believe that if we kill him this time, that it's just done? I see. I think it seems uh, very yeah, uh, that, likely yeah, that he's just going to come back. Twice as burnt and twice as strong. <laughs> yes. Right. And then, it, yeah, it's it was it was weird because like in the original movie, you know, Nancy and um, Johnny Depp's character had this big thing about like confronting your fears and dreams. Yeah. And so like that was the main theme of the original, and that's well, actually that's a, a running motif in all of Wes Craven's stuff is is confronting your fears. Like that's like a big thing in all of his films. So like that made sense. So that was like it was more of like a symbolic act. Like I'm facing this head on. I'm not going to be a slave to like this nocturnal terror. I'm going to confront it head on in my, on my own terms. That's the idea of that. So that's why she does like all the crazy traps And this one. They're like, no, let's just cut him up a little bit and then throw a lantern down. Yeah, on. Even, it's like, okay. Right. He, well, he, th- that's the thing too, is even with the original, like, um, is, is the character's name Nancy as well? I can't remember. Yes, it yeah. was, but she's yeah, not so, a character. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Nancy in the original, she like, her plan isn't just home alone Freddy and kill him. Like, she essentially, you know, she she has this plan to home alone Freddy and then get her dad, who is a cop, across the street to come and, like, arrest Freddy, basically. And then, you know, of course, that's not what ends up happening. And, like, then uh, Freddy, like, ends up on fire getting on top of her mother and then all that happens. But even with that, when they when they put the fire out and, and Freddy's coming for her, and she's like, I'm not afraid of you anymore. He, like, evaporates into nothingness. Yeah, and, that's the idea. That's Freddy. Exactly. So and, you know, long. and, of course, unfortunately, uh, in, in the end, it still ends the same way with that not really doing the trick. But at least, like, again, that, that logically, like, if there's a man who died and is still doing things, arresting him or <laughs> – arresting him. I don't know. That's so funny. But arresting him or evaporating him into nothingness by not believing in him seems like like logical conclusions to come to, which is just like th- – there's not even like a, a hint of that in this movie. I – you know, honestly, I would love to reboot the reboot. And I, I yeah. took back what I said. I don't want them to just anticlimactically shoot him in the head. I don't want <laughs> – that's, that's to be expected, right? I want what they did in Halloween. To pull him into the real world. And because in the original, Nancy's like says to her dad, he's a cop, he's like, I need you to be here. I'm gonna bring you Freddy Krueger. And he's like, Yeah, whatever, bitch. <laughs> so I want that exact same thing to happen, right? She brings him into the real world and like, you know, knocks him with a trap, does whatever, and right. then the cops arrest him. Yeah. Mean, yeah, like, like that's yeah. what I was saying to Mike is like I, I want to see Freddy Krueger like go in front of a judge. Yeah. <laughs> it's been like, trial uh, by Mr. Krueger, you're, you're being <laughs> charged Freddy, with three counts of <laughs> He's just a burn dude in the courtroom and they're like, Well <laughs> they don't know what the fuck to do with it. He just goes to the <laughs> and then that's just the movie like 
he's just in jail, which really is a is a much worse fate than evaporating or something. Yeah, I mean, right, that right. Hilarious to see him. In- God, that'd be so funny. Just Freddie like sitting in a jail cell. <laughs> well, and then they put him in Gen Pop. You know, the general population. Right. And everyone's like, "The fuck is this guy? Like, what are you in for?" And he's like, "Oh yeah, well, you know, I uh, I touched all these kids. They just keep beating him up." And like, yeah. that's what happens in prisons of rapists. Yeah. Yes, yeah. You and it, it'd be perfect dance. because it sets up for the sequels because then the inmates beat him to death and then he's right yeah, back in back. the dream world. Man, it's fucking nightmare on cell block. There we go. We just got to get the funding and we'll get this going. Fucking a, uh, man. It's, let's do a fan film, you know? Let's, let's do shit. Nightmare, oh, Nightmare on Cell Block 19. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I, I don't know why, but this reminded me. So, uh, of course, yeah, Robert England, uh, you know, he's a great Freddy. The, that's that's one of the problems with, uh, with I, I don't know the name of the actor. Jack Hilly. Yeah, that, that's, he's just, like you said, he's, he's, I, I, don't, I haven't seen him in anything else as far as I know. Well, I'm sure he's a fine actor. He seems like he's a good enough actor, but just this yeah, character is just like garbage. Um, but one thing that I think is really funny is I remember like a couple weeks ago after I watched the original, well, because I watched the original and then I watched the remake, um, and I watched a, like an interview with um, like Robert England. I don't remember what the context of of like what event he was at or whatever, but uh, whoever the interviewer was more or less asked like, why do you think that like the reboot like didn't work? And it's really funny because he's like definitely trying to be really diplomatic about it, but he's more or less just like, oh, like. I'm Freddy Krueger, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, like, I think his, he, what he says is they're like, well, why do you think that it didn't work? And he's like, oh, there's a lot of fantastic actors in it and all this and that. But, you know, they had just re-released all of my movies on Blu-ray, <laughs> so all these kids are seeing me for the first yeah. time, and, you know, it's just like, well, yeah, I mean, you're, think, you're right. You know, it's, it's, it's hard to, to think about it in this way now because, like Freddie and Jason and Michael Myers are such like, you know, they're such mainstream things. But yeah, back in the eighties, like Freddie Krueger was the MTV generation slasher. Like he was so fucking pop culture before like pop culture horror was really much of a thing. Mm-hmm. He right. was literally on MTV. Like he was when they filmed, I think it was um part four. There's a sequence where they filmed him on a beach the the makeup trailer they had fans like almost tip the trailer they had to like get him out of there with like security because they was getting wow. swarmed by people who was so fucking popular this and that's what crazy. new nightmare is about which is a fucking brilliant movie about the uh the aftermath of the franchise and what it did to the actors lives and how and west craven he's like i'm basically a slave to my own creation like i don't mm-hmm. want to be known as a nightmare on elm street guy but this yeah. is what people want and like it's a really, really you know brilliant metaphor, but I think when they tried to recast Freddy more than any other slasher, Freddy is Freddy because of his personality. It's because of Robert England. Mm-hmm. Like far more, like you know, I watched the new Hellraiser. I love Doug Bradley. Hellraiser is my favorite thing in the world. But the new Pinhead was fine. You know, right. it didn't have the same gravitas as Doug Bradley, but you can still get away with it. You can't get away with not having Freddy. Like it doesn't right. work. Uh, this person tweeted, because uh, I don't know, if, have you heard about uh, Alan Moore, the guy who did um, Watchmen, like mm-hmm. what he's been talking about lately? No. Lately? Or I guess, I, I, it's been it. like a, a big news thing, because I guess Watchmen just got like another HBO adaptation. Sure, right. And I, I'm not really familiar with Watchmen or Alan Moore, but basically what I've gleaned from headlines is that uh, Alan Moore has some pretty like strong opinions on like, uh, how how the way uh, like our culture feels about like superheroes and stuff, and right. you know Watchmen is like kind of very satirical in that manner. So anyway, basically, um, like <laughs> I guess Alan Moore, in regards to the new HBO thing, like told the showrunners, like I don't fucking care about this thing. Don't contact me. Like I want nothing to do with it. Right. And anyway, so that that's relevant because uh, this tweet that I saw was, I love both Alan Moore's. I disown the bastardization of my intellectual property. Please never contact me again. Versus John Carpenter's, I love getting a check in the mail to spend on weed and Xbox. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Yeah, like, that's... And I think, in a sense, that's why I love and therefore love to hate Halloween mm-hmm. is, is because that. It's like, you know, I think there is, to some extent, some respectability. to Like, yeah, you're, you're chasing that bag and, and we're enjoying it. Yeah, uh, John Carpenter is, uh, he's an asshole. And he's he? very, very open about that. Like they, um, there was a, an interview at a convention. Someone asked him, like, 
how do you feel about them taking like Michael Myers and changing the mythos and blah, 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 all this stuff. And he literally said, well, uh, strange things happen when there's a new Halloween movie. I put my hand out and a check appears. <laughs> that was his answer. And like, on the one hand, as a filmmaker, I both respect and abhor that answer. Yeah. Um, right. But I mean, he's not wrong. Like that's, you know, I have a lot of, uh, a lot of author friends like, uh, Brian Keane said to me once when they were going to adapt his uh, his book The Rising, which is like huge, um, and they had like Vin Diesel attached to it. And this <laughs> right. was back in like 2006. This is like when Vin Diesel was like, at his peak. Yeah, I was like, how do you feel about that thing? Like, how how do you feel about them like ruining this book essentially? And he's like, as long as I don't misspell my name on the check, I could give a fuck. The book still exists. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah. wow, that's I mean. Again, I love and hate that answer, but you have to be able to separate yourself. I'm very curious what Wes Craven thought of this movie. I don't remember yeah. him actually talking about it ever, but I mean, I never really looked looked into it all that much. Yeah, that's the thing. I think, especially if 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 doing that, if if writing the shit that's going to get you a check, uh, kind of gives you at least a little bit more freedom to make the cool, interesting stuff. Then, like, sometimes that's the right thing to do. No, well, you know, I think that there's something to be said about, like, anything you produce in a certain sense, the characters and setting and, and, and all those aspects of anything you produce kind of come out of your hands. Because, you know, like, fans yeah. and appreciators always have and always have had the right to take those things and, and kind of uh, imagine their own kind of uh, expressions of them. And so I think there's, you know, perfectly uh, reasonable take to say, like, well, what I do with my work is the stuff that, that I'm really more concerned about uh, my own personal expression and opinion of. What other people do with what I've started as my work is kind of outside of my control and always will be. And there are some people who are going to do tremendous things with it that I agree with, and some people are going to do things that I disagree with. And if there's somebody who's going to pay me a tremendous amount of money to do something that I either agree or disagree with, that's in a certain sense irrelevant to my artistic vision because that'll be expressed through what I do with my work as opposed yeah. to what others will do with it, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So, uh, Clive Barker wrote a really cool introduction to one of the uh, books of blood, and he said he was talking specifically about Hellraiser, and he said the funny thing about being an artist is the moment that you finish creating something and put it out in the world, it's no longer yours. Right. Yep. It belongs to the fans. It belongs to whoever's out there. They're going to bastardize it. They're going to love it. They're going to embrace it. They're going to destroy it. Whatever they're going to do, you have no control over it as soon as it leaves your brain. And I really like that because it's that's very true. And sometimes, you know, you get something brilliant. Somebody will write the screenplay to Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. Mm -hmm. Or they'll make the 2010 Night on Elm Street remake. Right, you know, yeah, exactly. it's, it's really like playing uh, roulette. You don't know. I think one of the things about, like, the, the reimagining of Freddy in the film is, like, it didn't seem to have much of a vision or a knowledge as to the things that made Freddy Krueger the unique kind of character that he was. And so any choices that they decided to make, they trended towards the more generic and scary, which uh, kind of which uh, kind of made it the – they're like, oh, what kind of voice should we give Freddy? And they're like, oh, let's give him this very omnipotent, omnipotent baritone, booming kind of like god demon voice mm -hmm. as opposed to the voice that, you know, that Robert Englund kind of had, which was much more, you know, human and, and much more central and much less – omnipotent and kind of like uh this this intimidating demon voice but the character still had to have all the trappings of the usual freddy krueger character and so you get these kind of choices that they're doing for the character's design and direction that seemed to clash with the delivery that the character had to have in the actual film and so it, it just didn't work on that level because it didn't seem like they had a clear vision as to what made freddy work as the kind of character he was in the very first little place. personality in this movie right that <clears throat> doesn't work like he just he feels like he's a prop he doesn't feel like he's really a mm. part of the movie he's just there to say his line and then just like flings his hand towards the camera and then he just kills there's always like one explosive death blow it's not like there's nothing unique about those deaths right yeah actually specifically the uh the the one guy uh who was who was killed in the jail cell like yeah, his just chest like, just like explodes as freddy's arm goes through it like, right yeah, it, I don't know, it's, yeah, it was, uh, I remember the, my girlfriend at the time when I saw it in the theater, we got out of the theater and she, well, she wanted to leave halfway through, 
<laughs> and I, was like, I paid for this goddamn. We're gonna fucking sit through it. <laughs> and uh, I said, "So, what would you think?" And she looked at me deadpan and said, "I want to put bleach in my fucking eyes so I can yeah. rem- never see that shit again." And I was like, right. "Wow, that's a review." Yeah, in in her memory scrapbook, there's just gonna be like sun bleach <laughs> spots. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> and yeah, it's funny. Uh, I-, I talked to you before about with uh, Freddy Krueger. Uh, something that that both I. I guess I could say that I love and hate is uh, like in in the uh, the other Nightmare on Elm Street films, um, Freddy like he'll like stumble on stuff right. and like trip over yeah. and yeah. like I I love that because it's hilarious. Yeah, right. I I don't like it because it like kind of like weirdly humanizes yeah, him in a way that you right. probably like, don't I'm gonna want get you him to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I I just like he like will tackle people and then they'll like roll over and he'll be like ah shit fuck. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, <laughs> and like, as much as again, like I, I like it because it's funny and goofy, but like I, I feel like it takes away from the terror. Oh, that being said, uh, I kind of missed it in this one. Yeah. I, I, I kind of wish they had something <laughs> like that. <laughs> yeah. All right, so uh, I have two reviews here that I'll be reading, and uh, this first one is a one-star review, and it's from Manual Ch, and it reads. Just finished watching A-N-O-E, the remake, 2010. I honestly didn't even know there had been a remake. Yeah, right. Totally hated it. I rank it right up there with Jack and Jill. (laughs) (laughs) Freddy Krueger looked more like a 90-year-old drunk than a horror film character. I mean, come on, special effects people. It's a mask. All you had to do was copy the original. I know remakes always make changes to the story a bit. But some scenes were stupid and make no sense, especially when they tried to go back to a remake of the original scene. This movie is more like those scary movies that the Whalen brothers do in making fun of horror movies. Uh-huh. This movie is totally awful. And then here I have a five-star review from Austin Kruger. <laughs> I do like Freddy Krueger, and my last name is Kruger. And my first name... And I like all the Freddy Krueger movies. And this one is even better, 2010 Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, it's incoherent. <laughs> it's absolutely incoherent. <laughs> I don't know, I read these reviews, and most of them start like, I will never understand the hate that this film gets. And a lot yeah. of them are like that. But then they follow it up with, like, the atmosphere was great. The look for Freddy was perfect. And, uh, you know, like, uh, the actor did an excellent job as Freddy. And then I'm like, yeah, well, I guess you wouldn't get the hate if you thought all of those were great then, <laughs> would you? Yeah, you know? that's a fair point. Because, yeah. like, a lot of the hate is because people understand that these are not uh, good. But I'm glad it worked for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah. this guy says Jackie Earl Haley plays the best Freddy Krueger ever. Are there only two Freddy Kruegers? Yeah, and he do- and and he doesn't spell Kruger. It's Freddy Cougar, like the cat, <laughs> like the large cat. You know, it's Freddy Cougar for this guy. Hell yeah! Tremendous movie. Backstory is great. It's got the perfect amount of jump scares and intensity. Dumb. Yeah. Okay. This is cool kills and effects. Think the movie got low reviews because people want typical funny Freddy. Well, say hello to scary Freddy. But Freddy wasn't scary. I yeah. guess is my point. Like, there's nothing scary about this character. This person really loves the line where he's just like, oh, God. And then Freddy says, no, just me. And I remember <laughs> hearing that and rolling my eyes yeah. and being like, God, dumb, overdone, and dumb. But I guess this is the first time this person heard it because oh. they're really into it. All right. <clears throat> if I could give this movie point five, I would. This movie is so bad, it's not even funny. It's an insult to the character that is Nancy Thompson, and the actor who played Quentin is not even that bad at acting, but this movie makes everyone in this movie look like they just want a check. This movie also comes up with child molester. (laughs) That is disgusting and should not even be put in Freddy Krueger's name. That is an insult to Funny Freddy. Second... (laughs) (laughs) Second, this movie, the Freddy is so serious. Freddy is the kind of guy to make some terribly funny jokes while killing you. And third, every character is lame and boring. 
Can you blame anyone who hates this movie? Well, I sure can't. And last and certainly least, the actors are so lame and they are so boring and they are all so boring. And I think 95% of these actors and actresses are super boring. And when that Nancy character is finally starts acting up, it's at the end. So if I could make this movie a point five, I would. Point five out of five. I don't have a problem with the whole, like, child molester angle just because, like, it's kind of like we were talking about earlier, where it's, like, it's, it is kind of interesting where we're, like, all right, murdering kids is all right because he's funny, but <laughs> no child molesting. Like, well, well, they're, well, they're both pretty heinous, so, well, like. Well, re- real quick, real quick. A point that I wasn't really, uh, you know, I hadn't really brought up then, but I was thinking, uh, horror movies in the 70s and 80s, and hell, even in like the early 2000s and 90s even still, mm-hmm. it treats teenagers as this kind of, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the double bind that all teenagers everywhere are always caught in, mm-hmm. where they're uh, old enough and independent enough to be considered adults in all the areas that we want to scrutinize them in, yeah. but young enough and not adult enough to be considered in need of constant supervision and protection in all the areas that we want to enforce uh, authority upon them for. Uh So it's the constant double bind of being a teenager. And I think, you know, we say kids correctly because teenagers in many respects are still children. But, uh, you know, like Freddy kills teenagers, which as far as 80s and 70s classes of movies are to be concerned. And again, even 2000s and 90s Mm -hmm. movies are essentially like a weird middle class between kids and adults where they're like little adults, not like children. Right. Mm -hmm. And so like it would be, again, still profoundly weird if Freddy were like coming on to a. like, seriously coming on yeah. to, like, the teenagers in the first one and all that stuff. Um, but I think there is a difference, at least in attitude, between, like, killing teenagers and, like, killing children in that way. Because teenagers, in many ways, are still children. I think that makes sense. And, like, killing, like, kindergartners and or in this case. If Freddy were to, like, kill kindergartners, like, on screen and stuff like that. Like, that, I think, would still be... Con- it, why, it might, why it might not be considered as distasteful... Mm-hmm. Uh, to some, you know, Lord knows others would find it equally distasteful and in need of sufficient warning that it's going to be the subject material of the uh, movie. Yeah. But, uh, you know, like, uh, so I think the point still stands that, like, the whole sexual angle really is, like, at least in our culture, it, it is, like, a different tone on the whole thing, you know? But, like, when we talk about, like, comparing, like, Freddy's murder of the teenagers to, like, the molestation of children, I think it is a bit different than how no, we I usually think, see Freddy. I think that's true. And uh, I don't disagree with that, but the point that I that I want to make is that, like, again, for me, like, it's it's not it's not just the fact that he like in this movie is portrayed as a child molester, where I'm right. like, what the fuck? Right. Uh, the thing that gets me is I I feel like the whole like red herring of like, you know, maybe he was innocent. Oh no, he yeah, definitely did yeah, it. That, that that just feels so unnecessary, and like, I don't absolutely. I don't know why, but that really feels offensive to me. No, I mean, like, look, I think I'm kind of, I don't know that I necessarily find it. Offended might be more, like, too strong of a word. No, no, yeah, look, I don't know if there's any part of it that necessarily offends me, but I think in the same way that, like, if you ever see, like, because, you know, like, me being a wrestling fan for most of my child Mm -hmm. life, like, sometimes wrestling would try to tackle a concept through the medium of wrestling (laughs) storytelling, and, you know, you look back on it, you go... This is just the worst possible way to try to approach this subject. Yeah. And in that kind of way, I think that this movie's choice to go as like Freddy as a child molester has the same kind of like, I don't know that I'm inherently offended by it, but what they're trying to do is they're trying to juggle the material of child molestation through a Freddy horror movie. And like, that's already a hell of a needle to try to thread. And then, like, the way they handle it, they just bungle it time and time again. And I think, like, your point to the whole, like, why in the middle of the film have it be like, Freddy didn't touch no kids, just to have at the end of the film be like, oh, oh, we see photos of how much <laughs> yeah. Freddy did, in fact, touch kids. Like, we as the audience will see them. Thank Christ they didn't yeah. decide oh, to God. make that fucking move. But, uh, you know, like, it's implied and it's pretty explicit. And so, you know, like, I... I don't know why they felt the need to do that at all. It seems like... Because here's the thing. 
Well, I think it's, it also what it comes down to. I think is like that one review that I read said talking about how like these these remakes and stuff like they they to some extent they want to try something new and like mm -hmm. and it feels like and like we talked about with 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 Mike you know it's like it's not I don't think a terrible idea to change up the Freddy mythos in that way of like oh like he essentially was like a he was essentially lynch mobbed right like I don't think that that's like a crazy thing to do yeah, right but. I think that they like wanted to do something like that, and I don't know whether it was studio meddling or what. But for whatever reason, whether the writers intended it to to be like a fake out in the the beginning, I think they were just they didn't want to commit to it. So they wanted to like have it both ways of like, all right, we're reinventing this, we're doing something new, we're innovating with the Freddy character, but also being like, but we're still tr staying true that Freddy is like not a sympathetic character. Yeah, but like, dude, every, you can't. If that's you can't have choice, it both ways. Yeah, that, exactly, that's, exactly. Because yeah. your movie can't be like half playing defense and trying to gain sympathy points for the character that turns out to be a child molester. Like that's yeah. just not the move, dude. So, Mike, do you want to lead off uh, with your your rating here? Uh, sure, absolutely. I cannot lie; it's been a very long time since I've seen the original Nightmare on Elm Street, mm -hmm. and the only other Nightmare on Elm Street I'd seen besides that one was, I think, the sixth one. I think it's called like Freddy's Dead or something like yes. that. Yeah, see, there we are. Uh, that one was the only one I had any familiarity with because it was like a VHS in my household as a child. So I watched <laughs> that a good couple of times. And um, I, I suppose I enjoyed them enough, but I never got to witness them as an adult where I could maybe tap into something uh, deeper there. And so with that in mind, uh, my only real exposure to Freddy Krueger as an adult has been watching this film here today. And... What's unfortunate about it is that I think that the film has ultimately done a disservice uh, insofar as what I imagine reboots and remakes hope to accomplish, and that is to bestow upon a newer generation the kind of gravity and uh, importance that a character may have held in their original representation to a previous generation. And so I think the film, all in all, probably did... A uh, disservice yeah. to the franchise as a whole because it didn't seem to take Freddy too seriously, or at least not seriously enough to really try to take a swing at uh, doing anything innovative or faithful to the movie as much as they wanted to pay uh, homages and environments and uh, scenes and, and kind of like uh, displays and effects and kills. It felt kind of low calorie and empty to me. And I think ultimately uh, made it for the worse. So with that in mind, I think I'm going to have to give it a... Nice hearing from you, Carlos. Out of... No screaming while the bus is in motion. And uh, I think I will actually watch the originals and kind of see what I can uh, dig into there. Because I think yeah. hearing y'all talk about it here today has kind of compelled me to, to view those for comparison. <laughs> to kind of uh, give, give me a little bit more to look at this film with in retrospect. Yeah, that's what's really interesting, you know. Um, I, like I was saying earlier, I watched the original for the first time like weeks ago at this point, um, and it was it was interesting because I honestly I wasn't like a super big fan of it at first. Like I was, I was really into the special effects. Like that was something that that I I could definitely appreciate um, for what they were. But aside from that, like it just it didn't hit for me. But despite that, for whatever reason, I felt compelled to watch it again. And at this point, I've watched it like three times maybe. I've went on to watch sequels. I've watched the reboot. And I found, honestly, it's kind of like made me question what it is, specifically with horror movies, that I like. Because I, I think that I, I don't like it in the way that I typically like horror movies, where it's like, oh, I feel so unsettled, or, you know, this is making me think about this or this, blah, 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 blah. But through watching it multiple times, though, I did realize that I do have some kind of, like, attachment and connection to it. Um, and it, I don't know, it just made me think about, like, what it is, what is it about horror movies that I like? Because clearly it's not just the one thing that I thought I'd do. It's, it's definitely multifaceted. So for that, I, I think that there's, like, or I, for that, I think that the original is wonderful. And then to go from that to this, which uh, just, like, feels so bland. It, it just feels really right. bland and drawn out. Uh, it's really disappointing. And uh, so, on the merit of that, it gets a... The only thing to fear 
is fear himself. Out of Come to Freddy. And uh, yeah, I really hope that we get a chance to watch the uh, originals right. uh, soon because I, I think that they're fun movies. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the originals are cool. I'm not like a giant fan of them. I do love the special effects and all of them. Screaming Mad George has some amazing special effects, especially the Roach, the Roach Motel death. I think it's in part three or four. It's fucking awesome. Um, but they're they're fun movies. New Nightmare is actually a brilliant dissertation on filmmaking and and the ramifications of being in like the horror community in the world. I think it was really cool. So if you watch nothing else, definitely check that one out. I think that's one of Wes Craven's best movies. Um, this one just it does not does not work for me. Um, I think that of the Platinum Dunes remakes, uh, like Texas Chainsaw Massacre was the only one that was actually good because I felt like that kept the spirit and the grittiness of the original. Um, this was just very, very glossy and pretty, like very CW. I'm not a fan of those types of things. Um, I don't think Jack Earl Haley was cast well. He's a great actor, but not for this role. Um, and the the bizarre, uh, you know, mishmash of, of the, the the pedophile stuff versus the child killer stuff, all that. It's just, it's a very muddled movie. Um, right. So I do love the lighting. I love parts of it. And with that, I'm going to have to give it... Hey, you forgot the power glove! Out of... Kids. Always a disappointment. If I'm being honest. Mike, I cannot thank you enough for your time. And you are welcome back anytime that you'd like. Yeah, thank you, Mike, very much. It's been a pleasure to have you. And uh, please go ahead, buy his book. And uh, after you do that, go watch the video on our channel where uh, we talk about all the, the, the sweet, sweet details of it. Yeah, thank you for uh, for I'm I'm just grateful to be had. Of yeah. course, yeah. I mean, again, <laughs> whenever you're ready, we we have a, a a laptop or space on the couch if you ever yes, want to make say, a drive down. The next time I'm actually able to make it out in person, that would be that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. All right, well, Mike, we'll let you get going. Thank you so much again. Thank you guys. I will talk to you later. See right, take care. So long, Fred. Um, we will be back to our normal release schedule um, coming up. So, uh, yeah, thank you again, and have a happy Halloween. Baba Booey, Baba Booey, Baba Booey! What's up?